Well, good morning. Let's start off with a question. What's in your wallet? Yes, I know. It's a tagline for a credit card commercial. But it is a question about what you depend on, what you rely on for your sense of security, and even for a place and purpose in life, for a sense of peace. I mean, all those things. Because what's in your wallet will simply make life better. But we all know that it's not which credit card answers those questions, even though the commercial might get under your skin and weasel its way in to make you believe it will, or which car, or which fabric softener, or any other thing will make your life better. So what's in your wallet is a way of asking the real question, what do you depend on in life? And actually, what is a wallet in our lives today, but the thing in which we carry with us all those th most important things to get along in this world, you like money, credit cards, identification cards, social security numbers, insurance, driver's license. And today, it's often our smartphone that's our wallet. Our, our iPhones are an extension of our wallet. And that makes our wallet just as big as a library. Just take a look at your home screen on your phone. And when you first open your phone, the most important apps are right there in front of you. And what does that tell you about how your life is organized or maybe how your life is disorganized? In some ways, it may well be a picture of what's important in your life, that home screen on your smartphone. So I'll ask, what's in your wallet? Now, all through these next five weeks of messages, we'll be looking to the Apostle Paul's letter to the church in the town of Philippi to see what the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, has to say to them and to us about that very same topic. So let's start with who he was and who he was repi re excuse me, who he was writing to. So Philippi. Philippi was a town north of Greece. It was taken over by Rome in about eighty before eighty years before Christ, and and to be sure that it stayed Roman. Caesar populated the city with retired military officers. It was a thoroughly pagan town, determined... Oh, let's just start at the beginning. Well, good morning. What's in your wallet? That's how we're going to start out with it. Well, good morning. What's in your wallet? Yes, I know, it's a tagline for a credit card commercial. But it's a question about what you depend on, what you rely on for your sense of security, and even for a place and purpose in life, for a sense of peace. I mean, all those things. Because what's in your wallet will simply make life better. But we all know that it's not which credit card answers those questions, even though the commercial might get under your skin and, and weasel its way in to make you believe that it does or will. Or which car, or which fabric softener, or, or any other thing that will make your life better and complete. So what's in your wallet is a way of asking the real question of what do you depend on in life? And actually, what is a wallet in our lives today, but the thing that we always carry with us that has the most important things to get along in this world, you know, like money, and credit cards, and identification cards, insurance cards, a driver's license. And today, it's often our smartphone, our iPhones that are an extension of our wallet, and and that makes our wallet just as big as a library. Well, take a look at the home screen on your phone. It's the thing that when you first open your phone, 
your most important, most often used apps are right there in front of you. So what does that tell you about how your life is organized or maybe how your life is disorganized? In some way, it might well be a picture of what's important in your life. What's in your wallet? All through these next five weeks, we're going to be looking to the Apostle Paul's letter to the church in the town of Philippi to see what the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul has to say to them and to us. So let's start with who he was writing to. Paul was writing to this little church at Philippi. It was a town north of Greece. It was a town taken over by the Roman Empire in about 80 BC. And to be sure that it stayed Roman, Caesar relocated to that city a whole bunch of retired military officers. It became a thoroughly pagan town dominated by the pagan Roman gods. And actually, part of it was declaring Caesar to be Lord and Savior. The very same words that Paul and we use to describe Jesus. And through Paul's ministry, a small thriving church sprang up in that pagan town of Philippi. And the story of how it started, well, you can find that in Acts chapter 16. Now, Paul was in prison. He was in prison and writing this letter. And in that day, prison prisoners were not fed or clothed. It was only by the friends and family that would come and bring food and necessities. And it was the church at Philippi that was a major supporter of Paul while he was there in prison. So one of the reasons Paul was writing this letter was to just say thank you. He called it a partnership with the Philippians in the good news the gospel, that's in verse 5 of Philippians chapter 1. And then he goes on to say in verse 7 that all of you share in God's grace with me. So for the most part, this letter, this letter to the Philippians, is a letter that's just full of joy. There's no real glaring issues or purposes in this letter like in some of his other letters in the Bible. <laughs> We'll find out as we work our way through this letter that there was lots of guidance about potential issues, issues that we face as well, but nothing really glaring and immediate in, a, in an emergency. This letter is just full of joy. And in fact, even though Paul is writing from prison, it's the letter where he writes, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. You'll find that in chapter four of the letter. So what's in his wallet, Paul's wallet. What does he depend on? What can we depend on, rely on, build our lives on? So in these next five weeks together in this letter, we'll ask five questions. This week it's, where's your heart? Chapter one. Next week we'll take a little bit of a time off as we welcome new members to our church and take time for personal testimonies. Then, Where's your head? That's chapter two of Philippians. Week three is the first part of chap is the first part of chapter three, and th that question is where have you come from? And then part two of chapter three, where are you headed? And finally, chapter four, how now shall we live? So for today, where's your heart? And it happens to be the heart of, the core of, the central part of this first chapter, verses 9 to 11. It's the summary statement. Actually, Paul's prayer 
for his hope for this little church in Philippi and, and for us. So we're going to unpack these verses. What does Paul have to say to us? Let me read for you first that opening that opening paragraph from Philippians chapter 1. It's verses 3 to 11. I thank my God every time I mention you in my prayers. I'm thankful for all of you every time I pray, and it's always a prayer full of joy. I'm glad because of the way you have been my partners in the ministry of the gospel from the time you first believed it until now. I'm sure of this one thing. I'm sure of this one thing. Oh, lost my place. Ah, here it is. The one who started a good work in you will stay with you to complete the job by the day of Christ Jesus. I have good reason to think this way about all of you because I keep you in my heart. You are all my partners in God's grace, both during my time in prison and in defense and support of the gospel. God is my witness that I feel affection for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love might become even more and more rich with knowledge and all kinds of insight. I pray this so that you will be able to decide what really matters and so that you will be sincere and blameless on the day of Christ. I pray that you will then be filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes from Jesus Christ in order to give glory and praise to God. The words of God for the people of God. Let's pray. Father, May the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable to you, my rock, my redeemer, my friend. Okay, so today, where's your heart? And it comes from the heart of this first chapter, verses 9 to 11, the summary statement, actually Paul's prayer for his hope for this little church, probably a house church there in Philippi, and for us. So we'll unpack these few verses, verses 9 to 11. Starts with, this is my prayer. A prayer. A prayer that God would be at work in these people, at work in us. And because of God's work in us, there would be specific observable, point addable changes in us, in our behavior, in our thinking, and how we live. You see, being a follower of Jesus, his apprentice, is not merely about head knowledge, being able to answer questions on a test, nor, nor is it getting right with God so that we know what happens when we die, although that comes right along with it. That's not what it means to be a partner in the gospel, a follower of King Jesus. It has to get from head to heart where our lives are changed. And we'll see later in the letter how it's about all parts of life. And yes, it starts with the head, but it has to get to the heart. So, what observable changes is Paul praying that we'll see in our lives? Well, first, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. Second, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. And third, that you'll be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Okay? So first, so that your love may abound. This is agape love, not about a, a simple feel-good love, although that might come with it. This agape love is about willing the good of another, as Dallas Willard would explain it. It's the love of God. Not only that, but also this kind of love of God has a result in greater knowledge of God and of each other. Love that leads to greater depth of insight, depth of 
understanding. Well, understanding of what? Well, a lot of that will come later in the letter, but for now, it's clearly that the love, the agape love Paul is praying for will grow in us is about coming from head to heart. Then, if and when that grows with you, what will the result be? Discernment. Discernment about what is best, figuring out what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Paul wrote this to people in a day when the pagan cults, the Roman gods, surrounded the church there in Philippi. And of course, there were those things which were clearly right and wrong. But what about all those gray areas where there's no real specific command? Inasmuch as this is Paul's joyful letter, we're going to find that he doesn't deal with very many specifics in this letter like he does in, say, Corinthians. In this letter, we're going to find out that he talks more about principles of figuring out right from wrong in the gray areas where living as a Christ follower means living side by side with people who aren't believers and are sometimes even anti-Christian. It was then, as it is now, a time when there were a lot of moral issues Moral issues that were blurred and distorted by the world around. Sound familiar? Living in a world that is made up mainly of people that are not Christ followers? And Paul prays for us that our love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight such that we can discern what is best. Like what? Like, what's best to express willing the good of another? What's best? What's, what, what's best? What's it like to scold a child? When to redirect a child? When to time out? Or even when to spank or not to spank? That kind of discernment. Like when to give money or food or even shelter to a person who is not acting in their own best interest. Or, or like a million other ways that discernment about what is best and how we must act in a work of the Holy Spirit as we walk closer with Jesus day by day. That's Paul's prayer as he opens this letter. And the result of God's love abounding more and more in us, that we're filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. When we're filled with the love of God resulting in discernment, good judgment, then we ought to be filled with right living as a fruit. That's an outworking. For whose glory? Not for ours. For God's glory. Notice, it's a fruit. A fruit of righteousness. A fruit of right living. Now notice that as a fruit... Fruit doesn't happen by trying hard. You can't make a tree bear fruit. You can only make the conditions right. You can water, fertilize, prune. <laughs> you know, by the way, I have two peach trees, and I don't know how to take care of peach trees. As a result, they're just way overgrown. There's lots and lots of peaches this year, but they're bug infested, lots of fungus that has to be treated and they are not even ripening. The trees are going to have to undergo a major cutback to restore them to what they need to be to produce good fruit. Yeah, we have to make conditions right for growth in the love of God, such that God's love bears fruit in us, the fruit of right living, of righteousness, or simply right living in God's grace through Jesus. So the righteousness, the right living Paul's talking about here is a fruit, an outworking of the love of God growing in us and between us, an outworking of the kind of love that enables us to discern what is right and how we relate to others in the world around it, and not everything in black and white. And yes, 
that is a matter of the heart, the head getting down into the heart that drives our everyday living. So what? So what? How, what difference does it make? Well, it's a big prayer from Paul. That's a big prayer for all of us that our love for God and each other would grow, that this love would enable us better, clearer discernment in all areas of life and that our right living in the way of the Lord would be the result. That's a big ask. So as we're coming to a close in this message, Paul says, and I say, I am confident in this. The God who began a good work in you will complete it by the day of King Jesus. And here's the thing. That confidence was not expressed to just anyone. It wasn't expressed to just onlookers, to sideline coaches. This confidence was expressed to the people, the church at Philippi, that Paul called partners in the gospel. <laughs> He wrote, it is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. All of you share in God's grace with me. That is the invitation to each and every one of us whether we walked with Jesus all our lives, whether we have known about life with Jesus but have not truly walked with him day by day, or whether you are hearing about the love of God, embracing him and how it changes our lives for the very first time, it's an invitation. What's in your wallet? A heart filled with God's love? A love that sent his only son, that we can be made sons and daughters of God? What's in your wallet? Now, let me pray for you. The very same prayer as the Apostle Paul prayed to the church or for the church there at Philippi. My prayer for you is that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen. Now, hear this blessing from you. May the grace of God our Father the love of Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit guard you, guide you, protect you, and bring you joy. Go in his name. Amen.